What's up, everyone? My name is Omri. Welcome to another episode of the LA Volleyball Podcast. Today, we have a crazy volleyball coach. He's got more championships than I can count. Uh, state coach of the year, right? You can see all the trophies in the back. Coach Carlos Gray. Coach, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It is an absolute honor. And uh, the trophies in the background, that was not intentional. You can, you can attest to the fact that the glare where I was... <laughs> wasn't wasn't working <laughs> for sure it's okay at least you didn't get the rings in the back that would that probably would have been a an indicator you know i can go i can go grab one <laughs> <laughs> uh coach how are you and how has the quarantine been treating you and your family um things have been okay here um i'm going a little stir crazy because my very existence is on a sideline and so it's been very challenging in that sense trying to find new ways to get that competitive outlet um, I think my favorite thing now is I went out and got a new smoker. So uh, I've been doing a lot of trying to cook a lot. So, you know, you want to come through. I, I'm about to do <laughs> – when we finish this, I am doing a 16-pound brisket. Wow. And that's the first time I've ever done something like that. So right after we finish this, I got to go in and I got to go trim it to season it to get it into the smoker on tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so I know – you know, I want to start from the beginning. We all know you were the coach at Pally, boys and girls, but I want to go a little further than that. Uh, how did you get your start in volleyball? I was a football basketball player at St. Monica's um, High School. And long story short, um, I used to joke with my friends because back in those days when you had letterman jackets, you didn't just have the letter and then the pins. You could get a letter for each sport. And I saw one of the guys had a letter with three sports on it. I'm like, I want one of those. So I wanted my third letter on this side. And, and um, a bunch of my really good friends were volleyball players. And they were like, my junior year of high school, they were like, man, you can jump, come play. And I was like, all right. And then uh, uh, Ann Hansen, love that woman to death, pro beach volleyball player at the time, comes up to me and goes, you should come play. And I was like, you're my coach. And this one was beautiful. And I went, I'm in. <laughs> and that was the end of it. And lo and behold, I ended up uh, playing volleyball and I went to SMC and played there. Um, there wasn't a program when I first got there. Um, I waited a year and then I played there and was all Western State Conference at SMC. And then I moved over and tried out for Coach Price over at uh, Northridge. That was before some of the, these other coaches way back in the day. Put it this way, the ball was still white and you could serve it. And if it hit the net, it was illegal. <laughs> That's how long ago that I played. The game has completely changed. Um, and then I made that team, but they didn't want to give me any money. Mm -hmm. They were like, nope, no money for you, no scholarship. And in hindsight, I probably should have stuck, but I didn't. And then I started coaching right after that. And I coached every sport, but didn't fall into hardcore, just girls and boys volleyball until 99, 2000. 99 2000 i know you got your starting coaching you just mentioned uh malibu high school was a huge part of your career uh so you came in there you started the program so can you just tell me what what was it like starting your coaching career it was a bit intimidating at times i was fortunate enough that i was i got to be a jv coach first so i got to see where we were going what schools we were playing what the level was i knew exactly what roster i was going to have coming back so it was a comfortable transition. Uh, the principal at the school at the time, uh, all the players were kind of pushing for me to take the varsity job when the uh, varsity coach left. And I was like, okay, I'll take it. And then when the boys position opened up, the principal literally walked to my classroom, said, I uh, heard you might be interested in boys. And I said, I could do boys as well. Great, you're hired. Shook my hand and went, that was your interview and walked away. <laughs> that, was, that was how I became the boys coach with that. Uh, so 12 years is a huge amount of time, right? Definitely amount, you know, within the first, I know, three, four years as coaches, we develop our coaching philosophy and how we want to teach things. And of course, over the years, we learn uh, new things that we want to teach. So could you just describe for everyone uh, your coaching style? I like to consider myself a communicator, a more cooperative coach. Um, as I've progressed, I've become more technical. Um, but a lot of times 
and my younger days, I mean, I wasn't that young. I was like 30. But they were like, what do you, uh, you know, what do you guys think we should run here? You know, I'd ask them. I'd ask players. You know, I had some players that understood that. But my, my biggest thing is understanding that this is an experience for these players that they're going to carry. And those relationships last. The scores don't last, except for in my mind. I, I can tell you scores and what I called and what I said in what situation. But the scores for the players don't last. The interpersonal relationships last. And so as a coach, I work cooperatively with my players. I communicate with my players. And I just want to make sure that they have fun and have a good time with it. I really do. And that sounds kind of cliche, but that's the way to have that success. Well, cliche has definitely brought you as many championships as you've won. So it must be something going right there. Um, now, at what point did you decide uh, to move to Palisades? What brought upon that change? And um, at what time did you make that decision? <laughs> well, um, small little inside scoop. I was actually offered the Pally job the year before I took it and turned it down. Um, I was offered it the year of 2013 was my first year at Pally. The 2012 year, the fall of 2012, they asked me to take that position. And I turned it down because the 2012 slash 2013 year was my son's senior year at Malibu. And I just kind of wanted to be there, you know, for his senior year. And lo and behold, it opened, the position opened again in 2013. And I just, I, I figured, you know what? Let's take that challenge. Let's step up. I had a bunch of kids that I had coached club. Uh, I had been on my club teams, and I figured I'd move over there. I mean, it was a good transition. It was a quick transition. The kids got to know me rather quick. And I remember sitting with my son and one of my best friends who was still coaching in Melbourne. And the doing negative positives and everything was just positive, you know, except for the personal relationships that I would miss with my kids in Malibu. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyone who knows me knows I love talking volleyball history. You know, I'm just like Tim Bergeron. We could sit for hours over a cup of coffee and talk, you know, for till, till the sun goes down. Right. So I do want to go into every single season at Palisades because every single season was memorable. Uh, so your first season with the uh, Dolphins team, uh, you went 21-6, and six, led by Caroline Grande. Uh, you made it to the finals and lost to Granada uh, in three sets. I have to mention, uh, you beat the same Granada Hills team in the beginning of the season. Um, and, of course, we, as coaches, we know at the beginning of the season, a team can be totally different uh, than they are at the end of the season. Um, so just how did that finals game go, and what, uh, what did you learn from it? We struggled with our ball control uh, that year, the whole year. And even like Carson took us four in that semifinal that year. Um, and we struggled with our ball control. We had a very, very good game against Granada. We were locked in and we ended up uh, beating them in a tough, I believe it was five. I believe it was a five game match in the regular season. And then our ball control in that final, we were nervous. We were skittish. And I remember being in that huddle and as much as I was giving technical things, I was joking around trying to loosen players up. You know, I was singing songs and cracking jokes, just trying to get us to relax. We just never relaxed into the flow of that game. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that to their credit, I'm not going to put it all on us. It wasn't, they, they came out and played well. They played out, they, they were prepared, they were hungry, and they went out and punched us in the mouth. Now, the next season, this was quite an interesting one. Uh, you guys went 27-11, and 11, uh, losing to Taft and Granada Hills early in the season, only to come back and win the city finals in, first, in four sets. Uh, this was your first championship at Palisades. Describe the game as well as the feeling of winning your first championship. If I'm not mistaken, we lost game one of that match. And I remember thinking, oh, not again. Because we were – I thought – that on paper we were the stronger team mm -hmm. because in that semifinal game we played a really really strong El Camino team in their place and I remember telling Chris Forrest who was the coach at Pally before that 
I remember telling him, I'm like, if we get this El Camino game, I think we can, I think we're going to be okay and set ourselves up in that final. And we beat him in three. So it's feeling really good. And then the drop game one, I was just, no, we're, are we really going to, on the big stage, tighten up again? And then we just started playing with our balance. We had, that team had great balance. Mm-hmm. Everybody, if you look back at that film, I still have that film. And it's actually one of the final games that we had. Um, it's one of the final games that we had uh, uh, broadcast. And I look back at it a couple times. And even the, even the announcers at that time were talking about how balanced we were. Mm-hmm. You know, we were going middle, outside, right. And Isabel Kelly had a great match, I remember. Uh, Melina Gorham in the middle had a great match. We were running a 6-2 system. And it was, it was fun. Mm-hmm. Palisades would end up making the finals every year for the next three seasons, uh, but would lose to ECR in 2015, uh, and the score being 13-15, right? So all these, these losses must have been tough on your players and probably even tougher on you, as I know you carry these losses uh, with you all the time, right? So uh, did you take any lessons away from these matches? <laughs> uh, you take you, – you, you don't ever want to see your players – devastated like that when they put their heart and soul into something you want to see them rewarded and for me there were so many times i was just telling them that i had a sense of gratitude thank you so much for taking me on this ride um i i will always remember that 2015 team because i think on paper it was one of the more talented ones we had that gross team. that that team's and, you know, having Olivia Zelon, who ended up in Texas playing the Barrow. I mean, Isabel Kelly was on that team. And I had just moved her to the outside because she was a middle of the year before. Um, we were just, we were stacked. And then we ran into a transcendent player in Kashana Williams. That she was transcendent. And hence the reason she went to Long Beach State. And, you know, so, um, but... I always have a sense of gratitude when it comes to that for the players taking you on that journey, because I don't care what coach you are. I don't care if you're Josh Barrard, Mark Dunphy or whoever, you don't have a uh, physical talent to make it happen. You're only going so far. Mm-hmm. So. For sure. For sure. I mean, you guys heard from David Shea, right? He mentioned Kashana Williams, how great she was. Um, and she, you know, Cena Agassi, same thing. It was, it was just a, a wall to run in, uh, into in the West Valley. Right. Um, so 2018 was a different year for your team. The road had led you to the semifinals versus Granada Hills, where you pulled off an interesting uh, reverse sweep. Right. Yeah. Uh, can you comment a little bit on that? That whole year, that 2018 team, I was probably, I don't like to say, oh, I did this well or blah, 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 blah. But that, I coached my butt off that year. That was the year that uh, Alex Leder was hurt for more than three quarters of that year. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, she had played in two regular season matches and two, two tournament matches before the playoffs. And she was hurt. And she had, unfortunately, she just had another surgery. Um, and we went into that game and – they, it was, they, they were close games, but they, you know, Renata was just a step ahead of us. And I remember telling Keeley, my setter at that time, we got to get off Alex a little bit. And we got to let, because we were, we were setting pipes and things of that nature to her instead of going to the floor ball. And I looked at her and I went, you got to trust your other teammates. And some of the other girls started taking swings, and they stepped up. Uh, Annie Wibblesman in the middle stepped up. Caroline, uh, Caroline Kadeshian on the right stepped up. Um, and it was – it was it, game three, they were beating us 20 – it was either 20 or 21-16. And that was the first year of that format, the city changed, where you – played after you lost Mm -hmm. so you you had to keep so then you got seated in the state because everybody in open got seated in the state and in the back of my mind i'm sitting there going what am i going to tell these girls to get them motivated to play again 
that had actually crept into my mind. Mm-hmm. And then I look up at the score and it's 18. And I looked up again and it was 19 before they got a side out. And we got another immediate side out. And it was, I believe, 22-20. And I went, we could get this game. And we got that game and used that momentum. And I think the most dominant image in my mind is my father-in-law. Um, he, uh, he has to ride a little scooter around. He doesn't walk well. So he's sitting. When we, when we won that, he's sitting on his little scooter honking his horn. <laughs> <laughs> e, 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 honking his horn, clapping. Barely knows what he's looking at, but it had the time of his life, and I watched the looks on their faces. I still have that championship point, that video of that, a couple of parents in it. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'll always remember about that, and that momentum just carried us right into that Chatsworth match. Um, was it, no, not Chatsworth, uh, uh, Taft, that yes. Taft match. That's my next question. I mean, that was uh, a pretty, I don't want to say an easy match for you guys. You had one hiccup. Uh, in that third set where you guys lost, I think it was eight to 25. Um, but then you came back to win the match 25, 23 in the fourth. Uh, I feel like this one might be one of, one, one of your more favorite playoff experiences. Um, so how did you feel after that match ended? I mean, you, you, you've gone through the most toughest season you've probably ever been through. I felt um, there was a sense of relief in the sense it's hard coaching. Like a lot of – okay. I have to preface this by saying this. There's a lot of perception of what this job is, what the Palisades job is. There's a lot of people that think that, oh, you just go get a bunch of club players. They all come into your school and you play deep court and you don't have to do that much. (laughs) And I've heard that on several occasions. And I know that opinion is out there. This team from the ground up, I had literally one player playing the position she played the year before. One, Keely setting. No, yeah, one, because Annie didn't play, Annie had to hit outside the year before. And Alex didn't play most of the year. And to have that team to overcome all of that adversity and to win that title against that team was huge. And it was really scary because a lot of those girls ended up, all those Taft girls ended up playing clubs for that year. Um, And they knew it at that time. They knew I was going to be their club coach. Mm -hmm. Um, But we knew that if we played well in the serve, serve, receive game, we were going to give ourselves a chance. And that was what we were in system in that match. Uh, I want to say about 65% of that, 65, 70% of that match. Whereas they were in their in system less than 40% of that match. And so they had dominant athletes, but we could tell where the ball's going. And we were able to set up defense and, and play a de- decent defensive game against them. And that was really important for us. That was, that was a crazy game. I remember being there. The Taft crowd was humongous. They were yelling at you guys. Uh, these boys are yelling within their, in their cones. Uh, and your bench is sitting right there. You're hearing it. Well, I guess nothing phases you guys. Um, in 2019, you guys had another great season. I don't want to call it great. It was probably a pretty amazing. You know, 37 wins is nothing to shy away from. Uh, 37 and 10. Uh, you made it into the open division playoffs again, but digging deeper into that, you expressed, uh, you know, some frustration at the seeding that year. Uh, what was the reason behind that? Because um, it just seems like certain programs get the benefit of the doubt and they figure, oh, they'll get through. It's just, it's just frustrating. It did. It it didn't add up. We had beat someone head to head and they were seated above us, you know, and it was, it was just, it just angered me. I, I, you know, I know it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be. And you're going to have to step up and do, you know, and and make like, just like the, the year that we played El Camino, we shouldn't have seen El Camino in that semifinal. They changed those two seeds. Again, benefiting another school who went down to another school and ended up getting beat. But we should not have seen them that year until the final. Mm -hmm. And that – things like that just irk me. The year that we won it uh, in 2014, uh, El Camino was seated ahead of us. And we had to go there. And we ended up beating them in three. And they were a second-place team, and we were the league champion that year. 
in the Western League. Mm -hmm. And we ended up having to go to their building for the right to play, play in that fight, which, uh, you know, thank goodness we ended up winning. But still, there's a lot of inconsistencies there. And, I mean, again, I know it's not going to be perfect. But sometimes it's frustrating. And I'm an emotional guy, in case you couldn't tell. Um, and I sometimes I let it out. Mm -hmm. Hats off to Eagle Rock. What a great storybook ending. I don't want to rip the Band-Aid off that one because I have a couple of oh. times before we started this thing. Uh, certainly the most unorthodox system people had seen uh, up to that point. But on the other hand, if you know Tim Bergeron, you should know what you're getting yourself into. You're going to see all that crazy, wacky stuff that you think is it might be stupid. Uh, but Tim is is a mastermind of the game, I believe. You know, that guy is, is really good at what he does. So can, what, was, what was your plan going into that game? And at what point did things start going wrong? Well, first, before I even say anything about that, I told him this. I told the papers this. I will tell anybody that listens to my voice this. That man is phenomenal at what he does. Absolutely phenomenal. I have the largest amount of respect for what he does because he does it by himself. He has a giant program. He's on all three levels. He's hands on in everything that's going on right there. And I, I give him all the props in the world. Um, I knew that we were in trouble against that team because of two things. We were not an elevate, terminate uh, team. We didn't have a dominant outside hitter. We were starting at that point, two freshmen on the outside. And our big gun was our oppo. And she wasn't this big go up, bang a ball down player. She was a beach player. She hit more roll shots. She hit positions. Um, we did have a decent middle, but it depended on how well we were passing. Whereas, and this is the brilliance of what he did. He took his two players, he stuck them on the outside, he set them high balls. All they had to do was go be done. That was it. Literally, you could not take that team out of system. They could pass the ball seven feet off the net and still get the ball to their best hitter <laughs> and get her a, a decent swing. Mm -hmm. And those two girls were good, man. They had giant hearts. I like to call them elephant hearts. Mm -hmm. Those two girls just went. And the one girl, unfortunately, got hurt. And I didn't want to see her because I was I – was, I really wanted to see what our chances were against her. Um, and I know about injuries because that year, our freshman, who had probably been our best pin, got injured at the Redondo tournament that year. And we didn't get her back. We didn't have her for Eagle Rock. When we went to their place and played them, we lost in five. And she just wasn't the same player after that. And I, so injuries, I, I, you never wish injuries on anyone. But I'm going to tell you right now, that team put their helmets on, they put the, and they just dug us to death. And we played right into their hands. We were, we were their best matchup because we didn't crush the ball. Um, we did serve tough, but they passed well. So they would just, hey, okay, next ball, up. And then they'd go outside to their one big dominant hitter. She'd crush the ball. You know, I still think that you know, we should have represented ourselves a little better, but I don't want to take anything away from them. They played their hearts out, and they he almost, deserves it. They almost lost in the semifinals, you know? Yeah. Oh, I was there. Mm -hmm. I was sitting right next to me and Armin, sitting right next to each other, watching that, watching that match. And I'm going to tell you right now, there is no other coach. If I had to lose to somebody, it was to that man, because I know how, how much he puts in. And, you know, I have a lot of respect for a lot of coaches around this city. I mean, there are amazing coaches at Taft. There's amazing coaches at Chatsworth. There's amazing coaches in my league. I will, I will thump for my league all day long, you know, between Memo and Allen and Raul at, at, at Venice. Those guys, those guys bring it every single time. I had the, the privilege of coaching with Raul and Club. So I know what his knowledge is. And, and, you know, Alan and I, Alan's a little younger than me, but he and I are kind of around that same generation as well. And we, we know. So 
I, I give props to Tim on that one. Mm -hmm. Moving into your first boy season at Pally, uh, your team had a lot of really skilled players from Nick Whitbrook to Galen Dodd, George Mitchell. Uh, in 2015, that was the year for you guys. You guys were led by Jason Whitbrook, little brother of Nick Whitbrook, uh, Vikas Lewin, Scott, and Jeff Stewart, who were freshmen. Um, and this, this is a great squad, if you ask me. Right? That was so, great. Sweeping almost everyone in your way, including the Van Nuys Wolves in the quarterfinals, uh, which was a pretty good match, right? Uh, getting revenge against Granada Hills in the semifinals, uh, who you did uh, lose to the year before, right, in the semis, and almost getting reverse swept by uh, yourselves by Carson in the finals. Uh, take us through that championship match, or even that year, if, if it was a struggle. Um, people don't realize, as good as that team was, we graduated a ton of guys. We graduated a ton. I mean, we lost guys like Sam Sherman. We lost uh, uh, Hunter Price, who was the setter for us. Uh, we, we lost a ton of guys. Um, and to then come back with that team, um, with two fresh, actually three freshmen playing vital roles. Because Scott, Jeff was the starting libero. Scott played OH2. And uh, Riley Byington, because we again, we were running a 6-2. Riley Byington was setter. Mm -hmm. You know, for a while, and then uh, to but to have that and to have that team win, it's huge. It was it was a lot of fun, and that Carson team, man, that team had a lot of heart. And I had coached against a lot of those Carson guys in club um, because I had seen them. Um, a lot of them are either HBC or, or uh, some of those some of those clubs. They were down south, so I got to see a lot of those guys play. Um, and it was a lot of fun. That was the other benefit. I had a comfort level with Jeff and Scott because both Jeff and Scott were on my team. We were a game out of getting the bronze uh, that year at Junior Nationals. So I knew Jeff and Scott really well uh, coming into it. Um, Jason uh, Whitbro, uh, he and I had a long history. He was 13. When he was 13, uh, he won a silver medal. RT 14. He won, we won the silver medal. We lost the final... Uh, to Balboa of Junior Nationals. So I had a comfort level with that team, and I knew we were going to be decent. Our biggest challenge was, uh, were we going to get enough out of the middle? And we did. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun. I wish that we could have done more Nick's year, the year before, because mm -hmm. Nick was one of the best setters. I mean, obviously, Marcus and Miles, you, you have to put them on a level. That's just no way. But Nick was an ink. Whew, man, and he was supposed to go to UCSD and decided not to went to Santa Barbara and just was a student. Mm -hmm. I know Jason followed in his footsteps. He also went to Santa Barbara. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I got to mention Dylan Flyer because that guy was like the hype man for your team. I mean, people, had, it, people had his big head in the crowd. Um, and so that was, that was really fun. And after the game, he got interviewed. Keith were jumping into the camera with his big head, uh, carrying him on, the, on their shoulders. That was, that, was, that was a nice scene to see. Um, he also, by the way, mm -hmm. also was on my club team. He started playing volleyball for me when in club. That's ridiculous. That's crazy. And, uh, and, the, all right, and here's the crazy thing. You just described that kid. He never spoke. Really? <laughs> he said... 15 words to me that entire club season. Wow. And for, to see that personality transformation, you know. The next season, you received some great young talent. I'm using the word great for now because they'll later turn into amazing players. Uh, and they were, they, honestly, they were already amazing players. Marcus Partain, Akil Tangator, Justin Howard. I'll mention you still had some powerhouse uh, young players in Scott and Jeff Stewart. And you had your veterans in Jason and Vikas. Right, uh, and mm -hmm. Priest, that is a pretty incredible squad. Um, and you guys played ECR in the finals. ECR pulled out everything they had to beat you guys uh, in, in one of the great city finals. Um, you guys have beat them twice during the season in the same tournament, actually. Um, so how heartbreaking was that loss? That one's one that sticks with me almost as much as the girls. Uh, no, about the same as the girls. Um, and the reason why is because of the fact that we had beat them earlier in the season. Um, but their, Alyssa coached her tail off. She was phenomenal, and I have to take my hat off to her. Um, not to mention the fact they had two – they had – this is the difference between having 
talent and then having senior laden talent. They're all of their guys, their main guys were seniors. And they're, they had two dominant outside hitters. Well, actually, no, 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 no. I mean, I'm misspeaking because their outside hitter was young. One of their, their outside and their outfit were young. Mm-hmm. But their two big guns on the, on the left side were both seniors. And I believe their libero was a senior. Yeah. Um, and they were just hungry, man. They, those were big dudes that wanted it. And uh, what's that? Colche, uh, he, he caught fire. And I did everything I possibly could to put a bigger block up against him but at that point they were going almost exclusively to the four ball and he was six what six four six five and he was just bumping Mm -hmm. and there wasn't our whole thing at that time we weren't a big big strong elevate terminate team yet. we were fast we had to be in system move the ball around fast 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 and you know we're running vix and we're running our offense and then but there's no substitution for it Go get it, big man. <laughs> and that's literally what they were doing. Throw up that high ball. Go get it. Go be big. Yeah, I mean, so Sean McPherson had a good, uh, had some good input there, and also Rolla Libero, uh, and even John McNally coming in there as a, as mm-hmm. a center for the first year. He did a phenomenal job. Great center. Mm-hmm. Uh, Miles Marcus. Great. Sorry, you go. On. Great coach now, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I got. Him. I'll get him on here. I know he's a little yeah. camera shy, but uh, I'll get him on here. That guy's doing a great yeah. job. Uh, great My- Miles Marcus, Akil Scott, and Jeff are now all in your lineup the next year um, mm-hmm. with almost everyone having a year more of championship experience. Okay, Palisades would defeat the defending champs, ECR, in four sets, and you guys got your chance to play in a state match. Okay, Corona Delmar was a team to beat, and their squad was legit. All right, so what was preparation like for that match? We had seen them earlier in the year. We saw them at uh, the TLC. Santa Barbara, yeah, Santa yeah. Barbara TLC. Um, and we knew they're loaded. And again, another funny story, a bunch of those dudes I coached against in club and then ended up coaching that year mm-hmm. uh, in 18s. Cause Scott and Jeff and all those guys, oh no, that was a year after that. Yeah, it was a year after that. Um, they, they blur together. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, but we knew, we knew we were in for it with them. I mean, they were huge that year. I think there was, I think there was, I want to say six, four and six, six on the outside that year. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but we took it, we were all sophomores and juniors. Mm-hmm. So we, we took it like, Hey, this was cool. Now next year we know what it is. <laughs> You know, honestly, that was literally what we thought was, this is cool. You know, it's great. Um, I, I know in Jeff's case, Jeff came up to me and goes, next year we're winning state. <laughs> we didn't. But, you know, he was, he was already looking forward and moving forward. It was fun to be on that stage. And I think that um, when I was interviewed at Pally, one of the questions they asked me was, We've won a few city titles. What's it going to take for us to make an impact on the state level? They asked me that. And I talked to them about it. And that was one of the, not prerequisites per se, but one of the things that they wanted from me was to take that next step. And to be on that state level and then the following year to actually win a game on the state level and to be one of the favorites in state when they were seniors, I figured like I accomplished that. In 2018, everyone knew you guys were the, the team to beat. You know, everyone had their eyes on you guys. Uh, in a way, you guys were kind of like the Warriors. Every, everyone wanted you guys to lose. Um, and every team had their eyes set on you guys. You know, it was just it was ridiculous. Um, so there are two final two matchups I want to talk about that year. Um, maybe three. Of course, I know the Dos Pueblos game against Chatsworth. Chatsworth was favored to be the number two seed that year. And, again, everyone wanted their shot at you. And this is where t- their, their time um, the Dos Pueblos tournament, for those who don't know, in the playoffs, uh, I believe they played a 42, 42 points, right? 42. I'm not a complete fan. Um, we're already there all day. You know, it, it's, it's tiring driving up there to Santa Barbara um, and then playing 42 sets. And, of course, being Mr. Gray and his Palisades Dolphins, you're going to be there all day, right? So uh, what was that playoff match like uh, against Chatsworth? They came out and they blocked 
so well. And uh, the thing was, Cena's a great coach, period. Again, not lip service, just facts. And uh, he had them ready. Uh, they served us pretty tough, and we were out of system. And one of, at that time, Akil's biggest uh, weaknesses as a hitter on a pin was he didn't handle size well. He didn't handle big block well. And they were up and committed. And uh, they got him a couple times. And you as a player know what that can do for you when you go up and house somebody on a couple. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, I, I tell my players, sometimes it's like hitting in a phone booth. Uh, you done, for you young people out there, a phone booth, they actually had a square tube, very big. Never mind. I dated myself. Um, but I knew that they were going to be hyped. They were real hyped. Um, we settled down and ended up getting the game. Uh, get, and, you know, and winning and moving forward. But they put us on notice that day. Big time put us on notice that they were not intimidated and that they were going to come and, and uh, they felt like they could come in and win a match. And I thought that was phenomenal. I thought it was fantastic. You guys were m- missing uh, Marcus and I believe Scott that day. Um, yeah. I think they came down with injuries, right? But still, they, they still came out. You guys saw what they could do. Um, and they, they put it on you guys. Uh, the next match I want to I want you to comment on is the ECR semifinal match, uh, which I would have been on the end of my seat. And to be honest, I was at the Chatsworth semifinal game uh, with some of my boys. And while that game was going on, they were texting some of their ECR friends like, hey, what's the score? What's the score? And then when, at, when the Chatsworth game was over and everyone found out the Palisades was down two sets, they were like, what, what is going on? Are, are, is this real? Is this a prank? So I can't imagine what it would be like in your perspective. Um, it was – the thing was, they were really close games. They were, I, I believe there was, there was a 26-24 and a 27-25 in there, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and the two they beat us. Again, props to them and their coaching staff. They came out, they came out, and they played well. Um, and, again, serve, serve, receive for us. We weren't as balanced as we wanted to be. We were very, very one-dimensional. And they capitalized on it. You know, they, again, another good uh, team that blocked really well. And um, we were really sloppy. We could not stop the four ball. And I worked my you-know-what off on that moving forward. That was a wake-up call. I was like, we got to stop the four ball better. We've got to block better. We've got to be a better point-of-attack team. Um, And that's one of the differences between that team when all those guys were juniors and the next year when they were seniors. They were much better at point of attack. Mm -hmm. But um, it was was scary. I asked Miles, and Miles and Marcus are very, very uh, religious there, and they're the most respectful individuals ever. And I asked Miles, uh, I think it was like a week later. It was before the state game. I asked him, I said, Miles, what was going through your mind, uh, you know, when we went down 0-2? And he looked at me dead serious. He said, Coach, I didn't think we were playing that bad. And they were winning. And I just thought that maybe God just had different plans for us that day. <laughs> and he was totally genuine, just totally genuine with that. And, um, but we ended up coming back and winning that. Uh, we turned it, and the thing was, we those last three, one of them was like twenty five sixteen or something like that. Mm-hmm. We got, yeah. if I'm not, and, you know, we just turned it on and we started playing a little more balanced. Mm. Yeah, the next, and now that was an incredible match. I mean, you guys can go check that out on YouTube on uh, Alyssa Lee's ECR uh, YouTube. It's still up there. That's a great match to watch. Um, the next match, the finals match, you guys saw Chatsworth back in the finals. Right, and this is this is a rematch, and this is a rematch everyone wanted uh, from that team. You guys capitalized. Right, the second set was pretty close. Uh, it was thirty to twenty-eight, I believe. Yes, lots of and service Akil errors. Went, yeah, Akil went back, and well, the reason why there were so many service errors is because we knew we couldn't let that team establish its will, because they were already good enough on the pins. If we had to focus, if we were spread out, worrying middle and pin, it was going to be a long night. 
So we had a lot of service errors because I told them they needed to serve tough. Mm -hmm. And if you, at, at the end of that game, that game ended with Akil serving aces, two yep. aces. And yep. one of the things when he went back to serve, I looked at him and I looked and I was dead serious. And I said, let it go. Mm -hmm. You go, let it go right now. Mm -hmm. Because we had that, that was, we had to, we could not, you know, our blocking, we just weren't that good at point of attack. We had to attack them there. Mm -hmm. That was a great match to watch. Um, it was very dominant, to be honest with you. You guys were, were it seemed like a, a complete turnaround uh, from that Dos Pueblos match. You guys were, were bouncing balls, um, going around the block. I remember Akil hitting some hard angle shots that were just ridiculous, ridiculous, right? So uh, you guys finished that match. You ended up uh, making it to the state playoffs only to face the same number one seed Corona Del Mar team. Now, this, these guys are crazy. Brandon Browning, Diego Perez, Patrick Paragas, Kevin Coburn, Brandon Hicks. Almost every guy in their lineup was playing D1. Yeah. Right? So you knew who this team was. You, you played them earlier in the year. How did you guys prepare and uh, how did the match unfold? Um, well, we also knew by then that, uh, I mean, I was coaching those guys because that Jeff and Scott, were playing, uh, Jeff and Scott were playing on the same, as because Pally had folded, as in a club. Pally State Volleyball Club had folded. The SMBC team, though, was a bunch of guys that I had coached, and they got uh, Hicks to come up. And um, so I, I was coaching, and I, saw, and I saw Kobe Ryan and all those guys at every tournament, either the final or the semifinal. So there was a familiarity there. Uh, I knew what they were about. And bottom line is that that team is special. Cobra Ryan's a beast. Yeah. And I was, I was really, I was kind of upset because Jeff got that concussion in that game and how that was turned into a meme. And that really bugged me. Mm -hmm. And I lost a lot of respect for that program because of that. Um, you never, ever make someone's injury a meme. But um, for the most part, it was a great match. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, of course, everyone on our side watched it. Um, and your initial reaction is like, dang, right? But then mm -hmm. I think after some of my players told me he got a concussion, he didn't show up to school. Uh, I think I heard that. He too. missed over a week. Gosh. That's he, couldn't, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't keep food down. He just sat in his room in the dark as much as possible. Oh. and. But you know what? Here's, the, here's, how, here's how tough that kid is. He played that same team, uh, not almost, almost that whole team. Uh, that was the whole 949 team. And they played each other six weeks later in the semifinals of the Invitational. And he sat in there digging balls. Cobrian comes on a D ball and he scoops him mm -hmm. after getting a concussion from that. So that shows you the heart of that kid. Can't imagine that. It's ridiculous. Cobron jumps incredibly high and he pounds that ball. Really yeah, he hard, does. You know? Yeah. Um, that season had ended for you guys. Um, back to the drawing board, 2019, uh, your final season as the boys coach for Palisades High School. Uh, this, this must have been exciting going into it. Senior year for most of your boys. Owen Lankar is the new kid on the block. Uh, Nick Conti has worked his way into the starting lineup, who's a phenomenal player, by the way. Uh, we played him this year and he's just great defensive uh, mastermind right um your record was 42 and three i have to repeat that 42 and three i'm not kidding it was 42 and three that's one hell of a way to go out um you guys went to a couple of big time tournaments i want to just first touch up on the best of the west tournament for those who don't know best of the west is one of the best uh southern california high school volleyball tournaments you can play in right um ecr also attended this tournament and tied for 13th palisades second place right ended up Losing to Joe Carlos, uh, Rocky Cheerley, and their Newport Harbor Sailors. Um, so what was it like playing Newport Harbor, considering you'd never played them uh, in years past? Again, and I hate to keep bringing this up, I see all those guys at clubs. Mm -hmm. So all those guys I've known since they were in seventh, eighth grade. So, you know, yes, is the game faster? Yeah, everything else is faster. But it, it's the same guys. Um, I think for me, the bigger thrill of that tournament was playing Loyola because I finally got to play them, <laughs> you know, and we ended up beating them. But 
we lose, I don't know if people understand, Loyola has at least five to six Pal Palisades kids on their roster almost every year. They have, they're both, uh, they're out, one of their outside hitters, their OH1 is from Pally right now. Um, and Jeff and Scott chose Pally over Loyola. Marcus and uh, Miles could have gone to Harvard Westlake. Akil could have gone to Loyola. But no, they chose to go to Pally. Um, and so playing that team is, and beating that team in that semi was, was probably my most memorable moment of that tournament. Um, just because of that, not to mention the fact Mike Bowley and I go way back. Mike Bowley and I, when Mike was training to, he ended up at uh, LMU playing when they still had a program. And when Mike was training, I was one of his training partners. And he and I go way, way back. And so at that time, my, I think Mike's two years younger than me because I was still working out to try to go to Northridge at the time. Um, but so we go way back. We've known each other. I, I've joked with people. I say, Mike remembers me when I used to be able to jump. Um, and so that was probably my most gratifying win. And not to mention, I had two parents and one of my assistant coach's sons on that Loyola team. Wow. So it was, there were a lot of ties there. A lot of ties. And a lot of those Loyola guys ended up, were, were playing or had played club for me. There were three starters on his team that played club for me. So that was probably the most gratifying match. But also with that, you kind of put your stamp on being legit. You know, you're not just a good city team. You're legit any, in, in any gym you walk into with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, though, those wins – were crazy. I hope to get the film from you sometime soon to be able to watch that because I mean, I, if you guys don't know, uh, we we played each other. Uh, Carlos coached at Westlake, uh, and we played in this Oxnard uh, preseason league. And after the match is over, about to leave, and I'm like, oh wait, I gotta ask him. So I just go over. I'm like, hey, Carlos, you saw that film? Like, I kind of really want to watch that. Um, you know, so those wins were incredible. You guys also played in the Karch Karai Tournament of Champions, which again is another amazing Southern California boy, uh, volleyball tournament um, to play in. Right. And then you also played in the Redondo Varsity Classic, right, where you beat teams like Miracosta, uh, Loyola, Palos Verdes, uh, Redondo, Saddleback Valley Christian, many other solid volleyball teams. Um, so, I mean, how did you guys do it? Playing these top tier teams literally weekend after weekend, uh, they must have been burned out at some point. Um, I don't think they were. I mean, I, my biggest thing was uh, trying to find – a balance of how hard to push and because that team, that team was motivated on its own. The difference between uh, a great player and a talented player is the mental and the drive. And all those guys had that drive. So it was managing injuries. It was uh, go, listening to my team. Like, Miles and Marcus were amazing. And by the way, I have to say as a credit to these guys, not one time did, I, did they ever big time me or not listen or anything of that nature. They were they – were, and, and, but I would take my cue from them. Okay, guys, we need to work offense. What do you think about running this or this or this? Like, Miles and Akil on a big, to give you an example, they actually developed their own big system that they wanted to run. Because I was going to run in 2040, and so, but Miles was like, Akil, run the BIC on me. So wherever the BIC, wherever Miles was, or what the pass was, when Miles was taking that set, that's where we were running that BIC at that time. Mm -hmm. And you can see it start to develop more in the Chatsworth match. Um, whereas I like to run it more as a fixed set, um, but I, I, allowed that, I allowed that freedom for them. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked, and then there were times where I said, no, make it a fixed set. And they were good enough to be able to physically just immediately turn. Um, we didn't have Justin at Karch Karai TLC. Justin decided to go to Coachella wow. uh, that weekend. <laughs> and so uh, we actually got to the semifinals without him. Mm -hmm. And then that Redondo tournament, um, Redondo kind of cooked the books a little bit and put us on Costa's side. So they got to 
to go into the final, but we ended up uh, beating Costa, the team that ended up beating us in the state semis that year. And funny story about that, they thought they were getting beat. Mm -hmm. Their parents, half their parents didn't show up to the game of power <laughs> because of that. And I know, about, again, I know a bunch of those guys from when they were young. And they came over and told me, like, my dad wasn't even coming. Wow. Because we, we had, we, we dominated them mm -hmm. at Redondo. Yeah, every I mean, score it was, was two sets from what I've seen. Every score was two yeah, sets. And it was, we dominated them. I mean, it was, it was a display. Um, but, again, it comes down to passing. They were in system over 75% of that match in that state semi. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if you're the one seed or the five seed. If you have talent and you're in system that much, you're going to have success. And that's how they do this. These quality teams, I mean, they're like amazing. You guys are beating them left and right. And this starts from practice in your own gym, right? As coaches, we always try to run drills that challenge our players uh, to become better at certain skills. Obviously, my drills might be a little different as my kids might not know how to play volleyball when they start. Um, but what are some of your favorite drills and how did you challenge your squad considering how skilled they were? I like doing this adjusted scoring drills a lot. Um, well, with that group, I have since changed. Like my girls – um, are different than my guys. With my guys, I did a lot of adjusted scoring scrimmage games. So if I had my starting lineup on one side, I'd put them down 18-10 or something like that um, to make them have to really fight to come back in situations. Uh, I'd limit what sets they could take or uh, wait, um, just to push that challenge. Um, whereas with my girls, um, I play fun, but very competitive games like baseball is one of our favorites. Mm -hmm. Uh, we play a lot of wash drill oriented games, um, things of that nature. We warm up with something competitive, uh, some form of wash. Uh, sometimes we do fireman drill where everybody has to play every position and you rotate and whoever's in that position, that is what you have to do. Mm -hmm. So when you're right back, you're the setter. Doesn't matter if you're Alex Leda or whoever, you're the setter. Mm -hmm. And the girls really enjoyed that drill. They loved it a lot. Um, um, baseball, just, it was just alternating scoring drills. I, when I was at Malibu, I was so fortunate that Marv Dunphy took me under his wing and he would let me go to his practices, you know, a lot. And Marv's philosophy was, you go from the simple to the complex, but you only want three to four drills of practice. Your practice should not be all drill. Your practice should be drill early, play late, with an emphasis on what you just worked. So if you're working blocking, you do two blocking drills, you do one other drill, you get into your six-man with an emphasis on that blocking skill. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I watched him do it. And this was back when he had, you know, nationally ranked about to, you know, and he won a national title that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I was so fortunate that he never, he would, I would, I could come in and ask him anything. And he would, he was very receptive. So I've carried that philosophy into everything I do. Everything I do, I try to drill early, play late. Everything, and, and play a lot. That's a great point. That's a great point. I like that. Uh, May 2nd, the playoffs would eventually begin, and your Palisades Dolphins were the number one seed in the playoffs, open division playoffs. Uh, Granada Hills, three sets. Chatsworth, three sets. And for the city finals, um, ECR had been the second seed. They made it to the finals. Um, they had a senior squad that had worked so hard during the previous seasons, during the previous off seasons. I mean, they all played on the same club team with the same coach. These guys had been working their way just to play you guys. Uh, and they came out firing. The first set, 25-23. Um, what did you tell your seniors during that side switch to get them to turn everything around, and how did it impact the rest of the match? Um, I, I told them very simple. I said, it was very simple. this team's not intimidated by you. You know, this team's not going to go up. There, there were teams where Akil would go up and hit two four balls in warm-ups, and the match was over. Because mm -hmm. the kids would look at it and go, oh. Well, so ECR had played – teams on that level all year they were at when we were at best of the west who was there 
in the gold bracket. Yep. There's ECR right there. Matter of fact, they were watching our games. When we played uh, – not Alamany. Saugus? I forget who it was we played. Uh, Servite. Servite. Mm -hmm. When we played Servite, every single one of those dudes was there. <laughs> they were sitting right there watching. And they weren't watching as fans. Mm -hmm. They were watching going, okay, in this situation, he likes to do this. You know, and so, you know, it was, and you know, I, the only thing that changed in our game between then and the final was I was running a 6-2 because I had let Marcus swing. Mm -hmm. I started letting Marcus swing because Marcus, remember, didn't play his entire junior year because of his back. Yeah. And he had just gotten cleared to start swinging. And so towards the end of the year, I started letting him swing some more. As a matter of fact, when we played Costa and Redondo, we ran a straight 6-2 with Marcus and Moth. Mm -hmm. And Marcus got the hit. But they weren't intimidated. Mm -hmm. And they were co they were freaking rock solid coached. Yeah. So you guys ended up winning uh the next three sets and the city title, completing the three peat. Uh, you might even call it a Palisades dynasty. Uh now it's time for the state playoffs. This is what you guys have been looking forward to. Although I know you and your team are extremely humble. You'll mention all the time that, you know, it's one game at a time. Um, and every interview you guys said, oh, we're going for the state playoffs, but we got to win the city title first. Um, and that's what I think I really liked. Um, but you played Saddleback Valley Christian, again, a team you already beat um, and would roll through them. And it came time, the state semifinals. But, you know, Miracosta, you guys have already beaten them as well. You mentioned those kids, those parents did not show up to the game and their service team uh, was, was on point. Um, so what was your strategy and how did that match eventually play out? Uh, this is from a coach. Rarely do I say or second guess myself as a coach. Maybe I should have done this. Maybe I should have done this. I think in game two, I should have gone five one, uh, around Marcus and let miles just be oppo. Um, instead of saying six, two, but I don't know because it also adds the dimension of Marcus dumping and it helps us because our passing wasn't as crisp. I mean, but you can't, you know, you can't go back hindsight on that. But I think that's the one thing I would change. Um, they just played a great match. Mm -hmm. Man, they played a great match. And we didn't play well. I felt good about our practice. We went over the coast of film. Uh, we went over tendencies. We knew what lineups. We knew what we were, who we were serving and what situations. We knew who we were attacking and what offense we were running in certain situations. And they just played well, mm -hmm. you know. I guess as best, as best as you can put it, to be honest. Um, the Palisades dynasty would eventually come to its end. Um, and you decided you wanted to take your talents over to Westlake High School. Uh, what sparked that change? Uh, primarily moves from my family. Um, I have a very uh, difficult situation at home with um, some some of the family members at home, and I needed to be closer to home. Um, and so that was my primary concern at that point was family. It, it had nothing to do with, and I know that there were parents that were upset and were actually saying, oh, well, those guys are leaving, so now you're going to go too. Mm -hmm. Um, it's never been about wins and losses for me. It's always been about developing a program where I feel comfortable and that I feel is special. And that program's special now, even without me there. Um, and I just, Westlake is 20 minutes from my house. I live all the way in Simi Valley. And it would take me, I would finish pal pally practice about five, maybe talk to players and get stuff together talk to coaches. So I'm leaving there at six. I wasn't getting home till eight, eight thirty some nights. Mm -hmm. And heaven forbid something were to go on in my house and my wife were to call me, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't be able to get here. Mm -hmm. And so that was the reason why I left. Um, and then the rest is the rest happens. If you want to hear about it, you I know you'll ask. We're gonna get into it. So you guys went three and one before the coronavirus hit. We played you guys in the pack view at Winter League. You guys are pretty solid. Um, and then out of nowhere, once coronavirus hit, uh, you had been fired, right? And I, I, 
everyone's like, what the hell? What's going on? Could you comment a little bit about that? Um, first and foremost, I have a lot of respect for that program. It's a great program. Um, um, there were no parent complaints. I love everybody loves to try to say, well, some parent, he must have made the wrong parent. You know, there were no parent complaints. It wasn't player complaints. The program had turned and was moving in a good direction. Had we have not had this pandemic, I think we would have made a really solid run into Division Three CIF. Um, the bottom line is there are other aspects to coaching besides what goes on between the lines and being on the sidelines. And there are paperwork things and there are program, overall program philosophy things. And um, there are interpersonal things that – in their administrations, well, not even their administration, basically their athletic director's mind weren't getting done the way he wanted them done. Um, and he decided to make a change um, based on that. Um, you know, the tryouts, when we had tryouts, scheduling, and things of that nature, um, it was not an on court performance thing. It was that difference in philosophy. And so, I mean, I didn't have a lot to say. There wasn't really a lot I could do about it. My parents were, I got a lot of emails and I want to thank those parents from the bottom of my heart. I got a lot of positive emails from parents from Westlake. I got former players that were reaching out um, and telling me, and had this have not happened, um, some of these players came to me with such heartfelt uh, sentiments about the difference that, they, that programs that I had run had made in their lives. And I never would have known that. And so you, you never want a job to end in that manner, but to realize some of the impact that I had, it was really special. I read on your Twitter, one of the, one of your comments, or one of the comments on your Twitter post was how does such a respected and de uh, decorated coach get fired just like that? And I couldn't put it any, any in a better way. Uh, it's ridiculous. Any school would be lucky to have Carlos Quick coach them. Um, I, that's just ridiculous. And I hope I hope everyone else agrees with me. I'm pretty sure everyone from the city agrees um, that you know not only did Palisades have those great guys, those great years, but um, you were de you know instrumental in their success. Uh, these are a couple fun questions for you, just to close up. Um, okay. Who are some of your favorite coaches in the city? I know you mentioned Raul and Allen, uh, but who are your, some some of your favorite coaches? Um, obviously I got to bring up first and foremost, I got to bring up my boy, Cena, fellow Eagles fan. Uh, he and I, uh, he's actually hung out at my house once or twice and, uh, we're, we're Eagle fans die hard. So, and then also to have that respect, he was nice enough. Um, and this is something that I do. Sometimes I feel a little deflated and to recharge my batteries, I'll go into other coaches practices and just watch how they communicate and relate to other coaches, not necessarily to get drills or anything like that. I just like to watch the way they communicate. Um, and he was, he was nice enough and generous enough. I came to one of his practices and just got to sit and watch him work. Um, and Raul actually uh, put me, let me run drills in his practice. I won't, I won't. Uh, Memo, I think is amazing what he did last year. In girls and that on that run was phenomenal. Um, you have Armin and Taft. There's so 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 many. I think I've already talked about Tim Bergeron. I think you're getting it done. I, I, I really got to give you. Some, I, I got to give that. you some love. I, I I think you're getting it done. And I appreciate that. To be at the to be at the age that you are, and have the awareness that you have, and the drive that you have is huge. I mean, I it's. That. It's, I mean, you, you've got it way, way more together than I ever had it at that age. That's for sure. I was in the clubs trying to get my dance on with bad clothes on. So <laughs> you got, you got me. I got to give it up to Cena uh, and Alyssa. Both of those guys, uh, people took me under their wing. Uh, I worked for West Edge and I worked uh, obviously for Cena and Cena was a little upset. I kind of quit on him about a month in when Van Eyes offered me the job and he was upset. He wouldn't talk to me for like a week. When I answered my text, and I was like, "Damn, like a relationship is ruined." Um, but even till today, that guy's been so like I, he's like my mentor. But we do I take a couple things from there. Tim's, you know, all these coaches. I think as they as they grow a little older, um, I think it's very important that every one of us uh, young guys, including John, um, 
takes these lessons from these other coaches and kind of tries to form the best program possible. And again, even as we're talking, and as you guys know, we'll probably talk for about an hour after this uh, podcast is over. I'll probably be asking volleyball questions. Like I said, I just uh, love talking about it. So uh, that's thank you. I really, I really appreciate that. Um, oh, one other thing really quick. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave Suarez and Dustin Warpe, who, and also uh, Jeff, Jeff Nakagawa, who all coach with me. Yeah, I, I learn from them every day. I, I learn, and um, none of this, none of that success that I've had is, it, it was a collaborative effort. It was, there was never a me, it was always a we. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanna make sure that, that everybody knows. There's times where um, I don't see an adjustment because I'm focused on something else, and one of them will come tap me on the shoulder and go, you may wanna try this. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. And then, so. I just had to bring it up. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest win of your career versus a city school? What was your most disappointing loss to a city school? Woo! You're killing me on this one. <laughs> versus a city school, that Granada Hills game, because of the stakes and the situation in that game. Um, I think that one, that one is the biggest. Uh, and that wasn't even a final. That was a semifinal. But we don't get to that final and win that title unless we are able to come back from two, uh, from 02 and 2116. So I probably take that one as my win. The loss is a tie. And I know you already know what I'm going to say. <laughs> you already know what I'm going to say. <laughs> it's because that one's going to stick. And again, Tim Bergeron, I love you to death, but you stab my heart every single time I think about you. <laughs> that one. And uh, and Alyssa, I love you too. But that God, I'd have had a four P. That would have been the first time ever in, in uh, boys' school history. It'd yeah, been Alyssa. done in girls. It, it'd never been done in boys. Gosh, Alyssa, it was all your fault. Come on now. God, killing me. <laughs> and the nicest person in the world. She and I will sit and talk forever. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Uh, what was the best boys team and best girls team that you've witnessed during your tenure and it can't be your own team? Woo! Okay. The... The... The 2000... I want to know. I'm trying to get the year right. That that uh that Corona Del Mar team was the year Cole Bryan, the year we played them and Jeff and Scott were uh, when when Jeff got hurt. That's one of the best volleyball teams I've ever seen. That team's ridiculous. Um, girls wise, the the Redondo team that we played when we won it in Fort. Yeah, in 14, uh, that had the girl, the two girls going to Texas, uh, Badar Gandhi, I believe her last name was. And they were, yeah, that team, that team was so deep. They had two girls going D1 that didn't start. Yeah, on that Redondo team. They were that good. They were that good. Um, that was probably the best girls team that I've ever seen. Who were some um, of the best uh, boys and girls players in the city uh, that you noticed over your years at Pali? Oh, goodness gracious. So many. Um, um, the first two that pop into my head are uh, Colche from uh, ECR. Um, there were Four Carson guys. They had the one setter, and I can't think of his name. I'm so sorry. By the way, another coach that I absolutely admire is Ralph Mertens. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of his setter's name on that team. Is and then they had the tall? one guy. Yeah. I think his name was Jaden. Yeah, he was good. Mm -hmm. uh, the one guy that was there that ended up being a libero for Long Beach, mm -hmm. uh, he was ridiculous. Um, I thought, um, uh, Taft has had quite a few, 
And then, of course, Kashana Williams. Uh, I can't think of everybody's names mm -hmm. is the only thing. Like, you had an outside hitter on that team that uh, – uh, in that, in that semifinal that kind of was trying to put the work in on us. And I was like, I like it. And I was like, I like that guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Nice. He, yeah. Um, so, that was him. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the setter for ECR. I thought he was – I would I would tell people if – I didn't have what I had, and I was blessed to have what I had at center. I'd want that guy because he ran a great offense. Um, loved so many Chatsworth players, so many of them. And I don't want to say his name. You could ask Cena later and splice it in what his name was because I mispronounce it. Mm -hmm. um, the one shorter black kid that jumped out of the gym, mm -hmm. I loved his fire. Yeah. I loved his fire, and I loved his athleticism. Mm -hmm. um, matter of fact, on Twitter, when he committed, I went out of my way just to tell him, all right, congratulations, now go kill it on the next level. Mm -hmm. Just because I just had, I enjoyed watching him play so much. Um, Taft's had a few. So, oh, um, I'm, I got one more for girls. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't, oh, God bless it. The, the, she played with a torn rotator cuff. Uh, oh, Carissa Bradford. Yes, my goodness. That girl's legs were strong because there was a few times she carried them. Mm -hmm. she, she was special. And she had the special leadership qualities. Watching her and Alex go toe-to-toe -to -toe in that match was fun. Mm -hmm. I bet, I bet. Uh, Kari Osborne uh, was on that chat routine. If you guys know, that's that, guy, the, that, that guy jumps out of the gym. Yes. He... he my goodness, I, just jumps out of the gym. My goodness. It's I just didn't want to mispronounce his name. <laughs> <laughs> um, over the past six years, uh, and maybe even longer, you've lost an incredible amount of weight. Uh, and you're looking great, right? So how has that uh, journey been for you? Um, it's been very rewarding. Um, really quick, because I know that we've been on this thing for like 90 years, um, because I talk too damn much. But um, 2013 was when I had the surgery. And uh, that 20, yeah, with the 2013 team, uh, they knew I was going to have it because I was missing like the second half of practices on Tuesday because you have to go to meetings and you have to do all of these things and check in and they check your weight because you have to lose a certain amount of weight to have the surgery. Um, the, I'd already told the doctors that I wasn't going to have the surgery in the middle of the season because I didn't want to miss that time or I wasn't, if I had to have it, I wasn't going to have it during playoffs. Um, I met with my doctor because my girls were like, okay, what happened? Was the way in? Was, they were into it. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I go to my doctor because I finally meet my surgeon. And he comes in and he says, yeah, I like you. I see you've lost 42 pounds. Um, we want to move up your surgery date. And I'm thinking, and this is in October, and I'm like, he's going to try to move it up to November. I'm thinking December, January. And he's, if he's going to move it to November, it's the middle of class. I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, and this was Monday, on, on Monday, October 8th, I believe. And he goes, no, I was talking about Wednesday. And I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so I took it and I went back and I'll forever be grateful to this team for this. I walked into that gym and I sat them all down. I sat the whole program down. And I told them what the doctor said, and they exploded and screamed and ran around the gym. And they were so excited for me, for that opportunity for me to be healthy. I mean, because I was 451 pounds wow. at the beginning of that year. Wow. And to lose that much weight and to have the support of the team was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. That sounds awesome. Right. Uh, I know you like to travel. Uh, what are some of the favorite, uh, some of your favorite locations that you visited? Loved London. Absolutely loved it. Um, if I ever could live in another country, I'd kind of want to live there. Um, Spain was phenomenal. Um, actually, Cena was one giving me tips on Spain. He was telling me, you got to go here. You got to go to the Sagrada Familia. And you got to, so uh, that was fun when we went on the trip. Um, 
Underrated country. You ready for this? Malta. Malta. Underrated. If you can check out Malta, Malta is hip. <laughs> um, I know you're also a little bit of a gamer, right? I know you. you a little more than a little. More than a gamer? Can you just oh, name, some, name some of your. What are, your, what are some of your go tos? Okay, right. Well, all the sports games. So I got MLB The Show. I do the Madden. I do NBA 2K, even though I get crushed. <laughs> um, I do a lot of RPGs. Like I just, I've just finished Last of Us Two. Uh, finished Final Fantasy VII Remake. Wow. Finished. Uh, I had Star Wars. I did. I I just recently because I got it for free on the PlayStation Network. Mm -hmm. I got the uh, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, so I'm starting okay. to play that. That's a good one. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of my wife is really good to me in this sense. I will come home and be frustrated about practice or a tournament or something. And she'll go, I already opened the man cave for you. Go down there because I have a big TV down there. And either I come down here and look at film or I go beat up some zombies or something or <laughs> in a home run and relax. Because and, I'm old. I need, to de I need to decompress now. I get you. Yeah. Last of Us 2, great game. No spoilers, though. I haven't played it yet. I haven't played you it. haven't played it? I haven't played it. Uh, did you play the first one? I played the first one, yeah. How emotionally tied are you to all of the characters? My goodness, I I fin I finished that game twice, right? First on PS3, and then when it came to the PS4. But like, just I couldn't stop playing it. I couldn't. Like, I had to keep going to see what was coming next. And I imagine that's the second game it's going to be like. I'm going to sit through it and just not be able to put it down. Um, it's like a movie, you know? It's like got you there, on the end of your seat. I'm just I, trying to say this in a manner to help you with your experience, <laughs> but to not give up spoilers. Just be open to everything. Yeah. That game throws curveball after curveball after curveball. Interesting. Interesting. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Uh, last question for you, Coach Gray. Do you have anything you'd like to say to your alumni, uh, as well as your seniors that didn't get to finish their season? Yeah. I, I, I genuinely – want to tell everyone that I'm grateful on a personal level for everything that they've done. Uh, for those that didn't get to finish their season, understand that if you overcome this form of adversity or this much adversity, there's nothing in life's going to be able to throw at you after this that you can't handle um, as an athlete or as a student athlete, more importantly. Um, for all you young people, I know you're frustrated. I know you, you want to go out and you want to go play beach with your friends. You want to get in and practice. You just want to make sure that you're safe. And it's going to be an important, important thing for young people moving forward to just enjoy the time. Be grateful for the time you have. I know when I step back on that side of me, the gratitude that I'll feel is indescribable. And remember, as much as in high school athletics are important, it's high school athletics. There's bigger life lessons. Mm -hmm. so that's what I would say. That's Coach Gray for you guys. Uh, if you like this video, maybe leave a like, maybe subscribe. Uh, comment down below who you think we should talk to next. Um, if, you know, again, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it, Coach Gray. Thanks for coming. Thank you. This has been extremely fun. Uh, probably my most fun one yet. Um, so hopefully appreciate you guys it. check in next week, see who we bring on next. Thanks, guys.